part of the problem I had as a promotion man was people saying to me, well, that Getty Lee, you know, I can't stand his voice. You know, who wants to hear that? I mean, is Getty Lee's voice really that bad? Throughout Rush's 40-year illustrious career, they've been lauded for many things. One of the best progressive bands, uh, progressive rock bands of all time, extraordinary musicianship, incredible, thoughtful lyrics. They've been a band that, especially towards the later years, more and more, until they called it quits in 2015, they were really, really respected in the industry. But a lot of times throughout all of their history, there's been one thing that I think they've been probably not fairly criticized for, and that's Geddy Lee's voice. Throughout all of the years, especially during the beginning, when Geddy Lee, you know, he had a very young voice and a huge range in that voice, he tended to sing, you know, with a little screechiness there. And it was the butt of a lot of jokes, although the fans loved his voice pretty much. And noticing now with the proliferation of all of these reactors to Rush songs, almost all of them, they're digging his voice like they like it. And they're hearing stuff from the early years and even in the later years when his voice was a little more mellow. A lot of a lot of people are liking Getty's voice. So what was the big deal? What was the cri so much criticism for Getty's voice back then? It's been documented and uh, pretty much that some of these critics, they didn't just criticize his voice, they criticized the band in general, you know, this like super thinking band and, you know, writing about science fiction and fantasy only. They never said that they wrote about anything else and they would criticize, you know, even what the band wore and then, and especially they would criticize Geddy Lee's voice. And I think a lot of these critics were just in a clique and maybe they were just trying to be you know, put their stamp in the in the criticizing industry, per se. And, you know, it could be that a lot of them didn't like his voice, genuinely. Sure, that's possible as well. But I think, as I, as I notice now how so many people are liking his voice, for this reason or that, I think maybe those uh, criticisms were exaggerated. But in any case, his voice is pretty unique. There are a lot of rock voices that are kind of typical rock voices his is a very atypical rock voice and over the years it changed quite a bit it matured and i thought i would bring to the attention of everybody how extraordinary Geddy lee's voice was during his tenure with rush and i want to dispel kind of the perception by some or even by many that Geddy Lee has a bad voice. I don't think he had a bad voice at all. I just think it was a different voice. I think it was a voice that had an incredible amount of range, as uh, we'll talk about in a moment more specifically. A range that very few, even rock, even great rock voices, I'm not gonna mention names. I think I'll leave it to your imagination to come up with the voices that you think are great in rock history. And as far as the range of the voices, you know, you can compare Geddy Lee's voice to any of them, especially in Geddy's younger years. He had a wild range in his voice, and that's what we're going to see now. I'm going to show you the variety and the versatility of Geddy's voice throughout the years and how he was able to maintain the ability to even sing his older stuff when he was a much, a much older man. Maybe not to the extent he sang it when he was younger, but the fact that he could do it at all and still it still sound like the Rush of old was pretty amazing. So I studied Getty's voice throughout the years, and I narrowed it down, I narrowed it down to uh, five stages of, in his career where you could say that during these stages, his voice was kind of sounding a certain way, had a certain timbre to the voice during these times. And if we divide his voice, his vocal range in this way, you'll see that he had an incredible, incredible amount of versatility, an incredible amount of flexibility that allowed him to sing a wide, in a wide range of styles that lent itself 
to the different themes that Neil wrote about, and his voice would fit those themes because he had that flexibility, which not many, actually not many people uh, had as far as that flexibility and that range. So what am I talking about? In analyzing Geddy Lee's voice, I came down to five different eras of his voice that we could look at and pinpoint and maybe even pick, oh, I think I like this era more than that era. So these are the five eras. I call them Screeching Lee. And then after Screeching Lee was Speaking Voice Lee. And then the next era was Clipping Lee. The next era after that was Mellow Lee. And the final era was Golden Lee. So uh, <laughs> as I go over these eras, you'll see why I called them the way I did. But I think they're pretty accurate as far as what his voice was kind of like. So let's talk about Screeching Lee. What time frames does that cover? So Screeching Lee was Geddy Lee's singing from the debut album in 1974, pretty much towards the end of Hemispheres in 1978. So during this era, there was a lot of screeching going on when Geddy sang. Especially, you can hear it in his first album. His voice is really high, and he's sounding like a rocker. So he's, he, because he can, because he had the ability to, he just belted away. And, you know, songs like Anthem on the second album is another example of the screechiness of his voice. And it, he was screechy, but he, knit, he, he hit those notes. He didn't really sing off key, uh, particularly during the studio albums. He didn't sing off key, but he really belted it up there. And in songs like The Necromancer, 2112, Lessons, these are songs on 2112, and songs also like A Farewell to Kings as well, where he was screeching so much that some of these, especially A Farewell to Kings, that song was not, I think it might have been played in the during the next tour, but it was never played again after that because that, that song, he sang really high, and it was very difficult to sing songs like that later in his career. But during this time also, in the song Cygnus X1, he sings the highest note that he ever sang in all of Russia's discography. At the end of the song where he sings, Sound and Fury Drowns My Heart, Every Nerve Is Torn Apart, that apart, that was the highest note that he ever sang. D during this time of Screeching Lee, he had such a wild range in his voice that he could screech that high, and it was still on key. Now, if you heard him during some live shows during that time, yeah, he tended to sing off key because he was like going all over the place. Not so much that it detracted really from the songs, but he had the flexibility to even sing a little off key here and there and it would still f fit the song. Although when it was recorded, like uh, All the World's a Stage, he was pretty much on key, but he, there was a lot of screeching going on. Another thing that Giddy did during the Screeching Lee era, which was absolutely ridiculous, was uh, the use of his vibrato. Um, when he hits those really high notes, um, you could hear that he's really um, vibrating his voice a lot. And he does it in many, many instances. And, you know, in the song The Necromancer, he does it a lot. It is a very interesting technique that he uses. And not a lot of singers could do it like he did it during that time, especially. And if you want to see a really good example of that where it's it's almost comical but the timing of it is just impeccable if uh, from the different stages recording which was um, an excerpt from the test for echo tour there were three discs that came with that recording it could probably be streamed now um, but the first two discs from were from the test for echo tour and a little bit of the counterparts tour but the third disc was from a uh, recording from one of the nights during the A Farewell to Kings tour that they did in London. And one of the songs they played there live was Cygnus X1. And the last note that I talked about, the highest note that he ever sang, Sound and Fury Drown My Heart, Every Nerve is Torn Apart. That part, Torn Apart, when he's singing Apart, Neil Peart is doing that single stroke roll on the snare, and he's vibrating his voice exactly at the same speed as Neil Peart is hitting the snares. It's so... it's. It's kind of funny, actually, but it shows what versatility he had, what control he had over, over his voice, that he could do that vibrato pretty much at any speed he wanted to. And during that song, he did it at the same speed that Neil Peart was finishing off that single stroke roll on uh, the end of Cygnus X1. It's pretty awesome to hear. So he had that technique going on for the longest time.
which he didn't use so much later in his career, but during the, the screeching Lee years, he made a lot of use of it. And very few uh, singers had the ability to use their voice in that way. So I would say screeching Lee, the first era of his voice from the debut album to Hemispheres, even though on Hemispheres it was more controlled, it was starting to merge into the second era of Lee's voice, which I call speaking voice Lee. The speaking voice Lee era covered from uh, Permanent Waves, which was 1980, to the S Signals album, which was 1982. This is a time where uh, Giddy was starting to have more control over his voice. The range was still there, but he was screeching way less. I think the last album that he was, you know, sang any screeching notes at all was the Permanent Waves album, where it had songs like Free Will. He, he screeches a little bit there, but uh, that's pretty much it as far as the screechiness of the previous Screeching Lee era. You have now songs where he's more singing in his speaking voice, even though there are notes that he sings pretty high, but a lot of, there are more songs that he's kind of like in a speaking voice. Right on Permanent Waves, you have songs like Different Strings, which is absolutely beautiful song. Very uh, lower key singing by Giddy. It's actually very beautiful. If you wanted to introduce him to early Rush, but you know, you're you afraid that they might be off put by Giddy's voice, a song like Different Strings is a great way to introduce them uh, to Rush in that regard. So you have songs like Tom Sawyer, Limelight, The Camera Eye, where a lot of it, Getty is singing in his speaking voice. There are notes where he sings pretty high, like he does in Tom Sawyer, but within that same song where he's singing like the chorus, the world is, the world is, loving life with you, that's pretty much in his speaking voice that he's singing. And there's a lot more of that going on. And I think that climaxes that uh, speaking, speaking voice Lee kind of singing in Signals, where there's pretty much no screeching at all happening anymore. And, you know, songs like Losing It, The Analog Kid, shows the lusciousness of Getty's voice. It's low and it's kind of velvety, and he doesn't have to be singing in such high registers to sell what he's singing. And I think, actually, during the early 80s, particularly during the Signals um, and the next record, that's really where Getty Lee is at the peak of his voice physically. Even though in later years, he probably learned better singing technique over the years. But I think that during the early 80s, his voice physically was at its peak. So from 1980 to 1982, it's the speaking voice Lee. The next era of Getty Lee's voice is the Clipping Lee era, where from Grace Under Pressure, which was 1984, up until Hold Your Fire, which was 1989, I consider that the Clipping Lee era of his voice. And what do I mean by that? During this time, he has full control of the range of his voice. He still does. And in, even on those tours, when he's singing the older songs, he's hitting those high notes and pretty much with not too much strain. But I do notice that in the recordings, the studio versions of the songs, especially in Power Windows, where he's hitting those really high notes, like uh, in Marathon, and One Moment High and Glory Rolls On By. Um, like a streak of lightning. You can hear that there's a shrill in his voice when, when he hits those high notes. It's not so much a strain, but I think a lot of that may have been the recording. But during this time, even though in Power Windows, I think it's more pronounced where there's that shrill going on when he's singing those high notes. Um, I think the timbre of his voice from Grace Under Pressure to Hold Your Fire has that same characteristic. And it doesn't seem to be as velvety, let's say, as how he sounded on Signals. But at the same time, he's actually singing better. There's like more technique going on. There's more range that he's experimenting with with his voice during this time because he can. Because now that he has more vocal technique, he can now sing those higher notes without having to screech like he did during the Screeching Lee years. And there's more expression, there's more emotion that he can sing with based on the lyrics that Neil was putting out during this time. So I think his voice very well fit that time of uh, the way that um, Neil Peart was writing. His voice was up to the task as far as emoting everything that you know Neil was coming, coming up with at the time. And again, that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, several songs where he's singing in his speaking voice 
during this time. There are quite a bit of songs that he's doing that as well. But the fact that he has a better vocal technique, he can he does you know doesn't need to screech anymore to hit those high notes. There's a lot of that going on as well, where he's singing really high. I, that's why I call it the clipping Lee era because you know it's almost like you know they're, he's turning up the treble on high on his voice and it's kind of like clipping at the top end. It's kind of like an audio term, but um, it th it's not that it sounds bad. It it's just that during this time, his voice sounded pretty much the same from Grace Under Pressure to Hold Your Fire, very similar, where he's singing in this way because now he has the vocal range to hit those high notes without sounding screechy. But now that he can hit him without screeching, you know it sounds pretty pretty high. So the next era in Getty Lee's development of his voice, I call Mellow Lee. And this is from Presto 1989 all the way to the R30 tour in 2005. So this is pretty much the longest period of time where Getty's voice sounds kind of more in this way. Uh, Mellow Lee, a lot of singing in his speaking voice. I think at the, during this time, he doesn't feel like he needs to stretch out his voice that much. He can pretty much sing in his speaking voice and there are tons of songs in this era where he sings like this yes again there are songs where he hits high notes you know they're, they're in there as well but i think he's more controlled uh, i think when he's writing the melodies for the lyrics that he's singing uh, he found ways to sing them more comfortably so if you want to to introduce someone to rush there are many ways to introduce someone to rush and I've, you know, I've made several videos on this topic, but um, you could look at it as if, you, if you're introducing Rush to someone who is sensitive to vocals, like they like vocals, and you know, they have an emphasis on that. I think there are many songs from the Mellow Lee era, from Presto to the R30 tour, um, that you could introduce your friend to that they would find Giddy's voice very appealing. Because Giddy, he can sing, he's a good singer. So it's not just, he's not singing with, with the screechiness of the past, and there isn't that sh slight shrillness that appeared during the Clipping Lee era, but you have all of these songs that, that sound so mellow, that he's singing in such a calm way. And, you know, here and there he'll throw in his emotive high notes, but that's not the emphasis during this time. It's more like, kind of like he's speaking to you, but he's singing. And it's very pleasant to the ears. And there's... It just shows how good of a singer he continued to develop into. I think he became a, a superb singer during this time. This was the time when he, his voice was fleshed out. Like he could pretty much do almost anything. And even during the tours when he was singing his older stuff, I, I think there started to be some sort of strain hitting those high notes from before, but he could still do them. It wasn't too much of a problem. Uh, he had a lot of control of his voice during this time. And the live shows, like for example, the Presto Tour that appeared uh, during the Time Stand Still documentary, I found that his singing there was, was just flawless. Um, it was very mellow and calm. And I think even his demeanor uh, during these concerts, they were not as kind of like wild-ish as they were when they were younger. They, you know, the band members were more calm and, you know, Giddy Lee really was focusing. I think he always focused on his voice a lot. But during this time, because it was so developed now and his method of singing was m much more improved, he could calm it down and, you know, use his voice to present the lyrics in a much fuller, more emotive way. I think the, the standouts, um, standout songs to me during this time that epitomizes the Mellow Lee voice are songs like The Pass, Bravado, Cold Fire, Half the World, um, How It Is. All of these songs epitomize the Mellow Lee era. I just want to throw in a little tidbit about Vapor Trails. And even though Vapor Trails falls in this Mellow Lee era, this album is kind of a little of an anomaly in that it almost his singing almost sounds like the way he sang on hold your fire there are a lot of high of a lot of high notes that are sung on this record songs like ceiling unlimited secret touch earth shine and out of the cradle there's a lot of high pitched singing in those songs but they sound more controlled more controlled i think than even back in the hold your fire days even though 
uh, Vapor Trails has a lot of higher notes singing. Geddy Lee finds the notes that he's comfortable singing, um, those high notes. Just like that free will, when he hits those high notes, he can still hit them. But they're high notes that are comfortable for him to sing. And there's a lot of those, I would say, comfortable high notes in the Vapor Trails recording. But obviously, there's a lot of songs where he's singing in his singing in his speaking voice as well. And those sound very pleasant as well. So the last era in Geddy Lee's vocal uh, trajectory, I call the, the, the Golden Lee era. Obviously, this is where his, his voice is winding down. He's older. You know, especially the live shows are what are beginning to show the wear and tear on his voice. Uh, not so much the studio recordings, Snakes and Arrows and Clockwork Angels. He sounds really good singing on those records. But if you notice, the live shows of those years from 2007 uh, to the end in 2015, uh, these are the years where you could say his voice is kind of on the decline physically, but his singing ability, you know, the way what he learned throughout, throughout all the years, he still had it. Uh, he didn't forget that, so he just had to adjust how he sang. It is more, it's very difficult to sing a whole tour of songs. It's much different than in the studio where everything is recorded to perfection because it's going to be put out to the public. I would think that for Geddy Lee during Snakes and Arrows and Clockwork Angels, there was more of pitch correction for his voice for when he sang to make sure it sounded correct. Uh, different from auto-tune. You know, when we're talking pitch correction, it's just, you know, you, you sing a whole bunch and, you know, maybe there was one note that he was supposed to sing an F and it should have been an F sharp, something like, something minor like that. Uh, in post-production, uh, they may, you know, pitch correct that one little part there uh, because he could sing it anyway. It's not like he couldn't sing it, but maybe they're not going to record a whole, do a whole recording, a whole other take just because of that one little off, very slight off. They might just adjust that. That's pitch correction. And, you know, that's a common thing. That's not a big deal. But auto-tune is a different thing. I, mean, I don't think Giddy ever used auto-tune. But a lot of artists that can't sing will use auto-tune. And it just, you know, it drives me nuts to hear it. I mean, if you can't sing, what are you doing singing, right? Uh, so there's a lot of that going on in the industry. So I'm not talking about that. But in any case, the singing on the two albums, the, the two last albums, Snakes, Snakes and Arrows and Clockwork Angels, is really, really good. You know, and worthy of all of the great songs that he sang in the past, this being the Golden Lee era. And if you think of the R40 tour, which was the last recorded performance, uh, you can tell that his voice, he was a, a little bit struggling towards the end. And if I remember, there were only two instances, three actually, in all of their career where they lowered the songs to a lower key so that Giddy could sing it more comfortably. Uh, the first one was in the Test for Echo tour where all of 2112 was played at a lower key so Giddy Lee could sing it easier. I don't mind that at all because that gave us the whole seven suite, 2112, the whole thing. So that was great, actually, and unexpected. The second time was when they lowered uh, Circumstances on the Snakes and Arrows tour. It sounded really good, even at that lower key, and Giddy sang it. And the last time, which is something I never expected they would do, during the R40 tour, the prelude of Hemispheres, they played that in a lower key. So the Alex Lifeson Hemispheres chord that we knew and love was not played during the R40 tour, even though they played the prelude to Hemispheres. Let's just call it uh, Alex Chord Jr. Uh, on that one, because they had to lower the key for that as well. But imagine in over 40 years, uh, you know, specific reasons to do it and they did it only three times I think that's uh, that's a wonderful thing and it just shows again the versatility the power and the flexibility that Giddy had in his voice even during the Golden Lee years and I think some standouts again during this time are songs like Far Cry Working Them Angels Good News First Be You To Be a very underrated vocal performance i think it's actually a great vocal performance especially the fact that he's so busy on the bass and still able to pull off that vocal performance it's really astounding and i think the wreckers and the garden also are absolute standout vocal performances of getty during this time 
Uh, these are these are the studio versions, right? The live versions of these songs, if they were played live, the live versions were not as good vocally as the studio, but he could still do them because it's documented in the studio that he did. So it just shows again, even in the Golden Lee era, Geddy Lee was still singing at a top level. So there you have it. That's my explanation of Geddy Lee's voice over the years and the versatility of his voice, the way he adapted over time based on the ability physically of his voice. And it makes for a most interesting listen that now you can, you know, you can in your mind, and I'll have right over here uh, what the eras were and the years they covered. Um, so you can see and maybe show to people, this is the voice of Geddy Lee over time. And you can pick songs from each of the eras to, to showcase really what his voice was all about at the time. How many singers can you do that with? I mean, I think uh, a lot of singers, they have their signature voice and then they just lose it over time. It just doesn't sound the same. A lot of people that happens to. But over 40 plus years, you know, the, the, over these different eras, there st he still had standout, excellent singing performances, be it in the studio or live, that you can pick from and you can showcase, well, look at listen to Getty's voice style during this time and listen how he sounded like here and and you can compare a song from the Screeching Lee era to the Mellow Lee era and see how completely different it's almost a, like not the same person but it is the same person and it just shows that he adapted his voice over time and his tech you know his voice physically peaked at some point in the early 80s but then his technical ability the you know the actual singing actually got better so Geddy Lee has one of the most interesting voices in all of rock history I say and I think that there are very few singers that you could document this sort of trajectory and still find gems all the way from the beginning to the end so I say that there should not be any more criticism of Geddy Lee's voice because it's one of the best voices in rock history this is Omar from All About Rush and I'll see you in the next video It wasn't any more shocking to me than Robert Plant or opera. It was, in fact, it was somewhere in between the two, and I found that quite intriguing.